Welcome to the Plant Centered and Thriving Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Kitchens. What's up? Welcome back to the show or welcome to the show. If this is your first time with us, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Ashley and today I have with me Sneha Jane, who is also a registered dietitian and she's a certified diabetes educator who works in an outpatient clinic that serves the East Bay area's vulnerable and underserved community to promote wellness and prevention of chronic diseases. She was born and raised in an Indian Jane vegetarian family, and she goes into a lot of detail on how she grew up and what the transition was like moving to the States. Jainism is one of the world's oldest religions that originated in India over 2,500 years ago. Today, it's a minority religion, and almost all Jains are vegetarians in line with the guidance to pursue ahimsa, which means non-violence to all living beings. And we talked about what that was like growing up, viewing animals in a much different way than how most people in the world view animals. Some Janes go even further by abstaining from root vegetables, such as garlic and onions. And she explains why, which was very, very fascinating to hear. In Sneha's work as a dietitian for over a decade, she has seen many clients struggle to balance their blood sugars on a vegetarian diet. And so she started her Instagram page, which we've linked in the show notes to build a community for people who want to adopt a more plant forward lifestyle. Her nutrition philosophy is to view nutrition and wellness as a whole rather than a quick fix. So you can see why she was a great guest to have on. And she also believes that nutrition is meant to add value to one's life and enable oneself to feel their best physically and emotionally. It is not to create confusion, fear, or add stress, but ultimately add to the joy of eating. So please join me in welcoming a fellow registered dietitian, Sneha. Welcome to the show, Sneha. Thank you, Ashley. I am so excited to have you on. I always love having dietitians on personally. So, you know, I think I'm a little biased, um, but you have such a unique perspective in being a registered dietitian with your background and everything, which I think will be really fascinating for the listeners to hear. So before we get started, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and just, just give us an idea of what life is like in your area of the world right now. Thank you. Firstly, I want to thank you for this opportunity for giving me a platform to share, you know, my perspective on plant based eating. Um, So thank you. And having said that, I will go right into answering your question, which was, you know, background about me. So a little bit about me, I am a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes educator. Um, I've been a dietitian for over a decade. And I got my diabetes education certification over five years now. And uh, that's been my primary focus area, which is pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes. I have a master's in clinical nutrition from India, as well as from the United States. That's because, you know, I was really passionate about this field. And I, when I moved to United States, I wanted to continue exploring nutrition in this country and learning more about the challenges here. I did go to San Jose State and got my uh, master's there. I started working at an outpatient clinic, serving people with various conditions from weight management to heart disease to diabetes. Uh, But that's where I really started finding my passion with diabetes. Also, because coming from a South Asian background, I had um, genetic predisposition to this condition. And I saw so many people of the South Asian background struggling with condition and trying to find, you know, what would be the best way of eating for them. And so I started my work as a diabetes educator in the United States, but also have been a bariatric dietitian back home where I mostly counseled uh, weight loss surgery patients. And then here, other than diabetes, I've also had the opportunity to work at an eating disorders clinic. I've had the opportunity to teach a food and culture class at San Jose State, the same school that I graduated from. And I think I really enjoyed uh, teaching. 
lately i discovered about the social media platform you know i know that many people discovered this pre covid but for me it was post covid okay. um and i like the idea of kind of you know not sitting in a clinical setting and telling patients what to do but actually showing them how that can be done so that's where you know i started sharing grass recipes and some tips and i found you know many other registered dietitians like yourself you know doing all of these things which really motivated me and inspired me um to spread nutrition beyond the clinical setting in the social media world yes isn't it amazing cuz okay cuz i think we probably graduated around the same time cuz i've i've also mm-hmm. been a dietitian for a little over 10 years and it mm-hmm. isn't isn't it amazing how our passions or he just even hearing you you talk your passion has evolved and even how you approach nutrition now on social media i mean we weren't anticipating that back then at all never yeah exactly <laughs> and there was no training for it whatsoever and you know it was the clinical experience was different the outpatient was different of course but this is a whole different world Yes, it really is and it makes me wonder if they actually teach this now in school. I mean, I don't know if they do or not, like how to kind of be present on social media because that's a big part of being a registered dietitian especially if you have a private practice. Absolutely. And you know, after being in this field for so many years, I'm realizing that how every dietitian can offer a unique perspective and just being out there is so important because there are so many different people looking to find some relatability with you you know whether it is your expertise in certain style of eating or whether it's your cultural background and so i 100% agree with you that the current students who go to nutrition school and if anybody is listening you know just go ahead and create an account be there yeah. you know and contribute to the growing field of nutrition yes yes 100% i cannot agree more So you mentioned you know we all have different cultural backgrounds so what was it like growing up in India and how was that for you more from maybe a nutrition perspective looking back to where you are now and you grew up in a, a primarily vegetarian household I did okay. I did so yeah. my plant based eating journey happened by chance so I was born in a Indian vegetarian family and I was born in a small uh, religious group called as the Jains and jainism is one of the oldest ancient religions of india almost 2500 years ago is when it started and i know that a lot of people hear about hinduism and buddhism but jainism also started around the same time and the main uh, principle of jainism is to achieve spiritual enlightenment with non-violence as one of their main virtues and that's where I started the plant based eating or that's where I inherited the plant based eating if I may say so from my grandparents because yeah. they were jains and I bro- grew up a jain and the goal was non violence so because the goal is non violence automatically you know there's compassion for animal and there is this knowledge around not eating animal foods for nutrition reasons and much much before vegetarianism or veganism started getting popular for its health reasons it was practiced growing up um in india even to a extent that there are some jains who try to avoid underground vegetables and this is something that might be new to you but for example potatoes and onions are grown underground and when you pluck those vegetables to eat you know you're also getting out some soil with it and little organisms that live in there ah, and so yeah. they care about that extent to not eating those foods which create you know that impact on little microorganisms which we cannot see but are present in air soil or water yeah i'm curious what that was like was there were there in, like did you live in a a community where there were a lot of people who were of jainism or was that something that was like oh like that those are kind of like the weird people because they don't eat meat or they're not trying to do any harm what was that like a little bit of everything i'm going <laughs> to say because you know india um, especially the part where i grew after my uh, grandparents kind of moved from one state to another the the state that they were in was called rajasthan you'll find a lot more jains there in rajasthan but then we moved to maharashtra where we also had you know we grew up in a multicultural background so people ate all kinds of diets it was not just vegetarians so i remember a few friends of course making fun of me for not eating 
eating meat. And then there were few friends who were tempting me to eat meat. And they're like, this fish is so good. And especially, you know, I grew up in a coastal region. So fish is one of the popular things there on the menu. And they're like, I'm going to sneak some fish into your food. And you're not even going to know it. And you're going to fall in love with it. And you're going to want to eat it. And, um, (laughs) you know, just when you go to school, you have all kind of friends, you know, trying to want to convince you to do all sorts of things with them. So the peer pressure was there. But I think my foundation was so strong and the belief was so strong to not uh, create harm to animals that it never tempted me to even try any of those things. Having said that, where I lived, a lot of people also practice Jainism. So it was kind of easier to stay on your eating style. And it sounds like the options too were readily available where it wasn't like you had to search you know, far and wide to basically find foods to meet how you wanted to eat. Absolutely. But I do want to bring up here that it was a faith-based vegetarianism, meaning, you know, nutrients were never in question when you're trying to Mm. eat. And if I speak specifically about a South Asian diet, um, you know, although we are vegetarians, our diets also tend to be higher in grains compared to greens. The Mm. vegetarianism or veganism that we know about today is more whole foods plant-based focus. Uh, But some of the cultural recipes, you know, can be high in refined carbohydrates, you know, ghee, which is very popular in India, sugar. So nutrient was never the focus. But after studying nutrition and after moving to the United States and getting introduced to the global cuisine, you know, I learned to modify my own plant based eating from a more cultural to a more nutrient balanced way. Mm, Yeah, 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 that definitely makes sense. Even growing up, what was it like? Because the way you viewed animals was a lot different than how a lot of us view animals growing up. So what was yes. what was that like? It was always met with a lot of kindness and compassion. Mm. And it is common in India to find stray dogs and stray cows. And, you know, also Hindus treat cows as a form of uh, God. And so they worship cows. So I remember, you know, always trying to feed them the leftover food from my lunchbox and, you know, meeting them with a lot of compassion and kindness. And also remember, I had a friend who used to have this fish pond, you know, and I remember having this conversation with her and As much as I loved seeing those little fishes, I told her what my grandma told me. I said, do you know that these fishes are feeling confined in that little fish pond and it Mm. might be great for you as a pet and you might be having this special relationship, but, you know, they really like to be in their own environment. My friend did not necessarily not agree with me, but at the same time, I don't think it was easy for her to see the other side of not using them for her own benefit, but to really letting them be in their own environment. So I remember from a very, very young age being very compassionate um, towards, you know, pets and animals and birds. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do now. Uh, I have a three-year-old son and we were at a birthday party uh, last week. And he wanted to eat the cake. And I'm like, can you ask if the cake is eggless? And he did. And then when he learned that it was not eggless, he just looked at me and he said, mom, no, it's not eggless. It has egg. So then I asked him, so what would you like to do? He's like, I don't want to eat it, mommy. Wow. And, you know, that was a proud moment for me. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's, it's great having learned all this from my grandmother and now trying to pass it on. To my son. Yeah. And I very much know that is going to grow in a very different environment than mine. But as long as I have this capacity to influence him, I'm going to. But yeah. when he's an adult, he is totally fine to take whatever his own decisions are. And I totally sure. respect that. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm sure that's tough too, because I'm sure there's moments like these where it's like proud mom moments. Yes, you know, you made that decision. But I'm sure yes. like that it comes with some heartache, like, well, one day they're going to, you know, really make their own decisions and it may, may align yes. or it may not. But I have yes. read before, and I know there's a lot of articles out there that talk about how kids, especially like we're innately compassionate towards animals yes. and yes. 
especially in Westernized culture, there really, and in a lot of cultures, there isn't that connection that what is on our plate is an animal. Animal. Yeah. Yes. And so I, I think it's neat to hear that, you know, even him being so young, making that connection of like knowing where an egg comes from and knowing that, you know, we don't do harm to yes. animals and kind of making that decision. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Also, because, you know, whenever there are environmental cues to teach him this concept, I'm using, for example, when I invested in an air fryer. I think there was a picture of French fries and there was a picture of chicken tenders. And I told him, you know what that is? And then I went a step ahead to explain to him. And then every time he looks at the pictures, he's like, that is chicken tenders, mommy. We don't eat chicken. We are vegetarians. So, you know, just doing those little things can really help them see world in a different way. And of course, you know, reading books, I also took him to a farm and, you know, Mm -hmm. he had an opportunity to pet some goats and some chickens on the farm. And so I think that, you know, if you take these little steps, you can uh, definitely instill compassion in your children, if that's one of your goals. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about this recently. We had someone who runs an animal sanctuary and she was encouraging the listeners and maybe you listening may, may, may remember this to visit sanctuaries or visit places that it's not necessarily like a zoo, but a place where you can actually interact with the animals in an environment. They, they were either rescued or that they, you know, have built to house these animals um, versus like maybe someplace that isn't quite as kind. So I think that's really neat as well. Yes. Yes. And not to mention that I don't get eyes from some of the parents and they're like, come on, he's just a three-year-old, let him eat the cake. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's not about the cake. You know, I'm fine with him eating the cake, but he's beginning to understand this concept of vegetarian diet, vegan diet, you know, and if he is okay, and if he's willing to not eat the cake, then I just want to support that for now. And then when he grows up, he will have the decision or the choice to do what pleases to him at that time. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So you were, you worked in India. Well, you went to school and worked for a little bit in India and then you moved yes. here about, about a decade ago, right? To the States. Yes. Yes. In okay. 2010. Yes. And, okay. What was that transition like? It was, you know, it was hard to be honest with you. Um, yeah. Also because I didn't have family here. The only person I knew was my husband. So yeah, it it was, it was um, very, very hard. Having said that, my husband was from the same faith of Jainism, you know, and so eating wise at home, it was not hard. But what was the hard part was going to the restaurants and ordering vegetarian food. 10 years ago, the options were not so many that you see now. And also I found what was different was the vegetarian or the vegan food options that you got here. I felt, and this is only my personal opinion, some people might not agree with it, but I felt it was more catered towards people who were meat eaters and looking for that same kind of texture and the same kind of experience with vegetarian food. So all of these mock meats were very new to me and I was grown up not eating meat in any form. And what was very intriguing is I remember going to a vegan restaurant and I tried to order I think it was Pad Thai or something, and they had made shrimp, but the shrimp had the exact shape of a shrimp. However, it was made from a root vegetable, such as purple yam. And, you know, it just looked so foreign to me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a vegetarian, but I'm not sure I can eat that. Mm -hmm. you know so that was the biggest thing that I found that the vegetarian foods here were more catered towards meat eaters as opposed to someone who had practiced vegetarian diets for a long long time Uh, you know it's funny you say that because there is a very popular plant-based meat company out there and I think I remember reading that like 95 percent of their consumers are meat eaters because they're actually, they're not really making this food for vegans or vegetarians. It's more for people who are maybe wanting to transition or just eat less meat in general, but are already meat eaters. So that, yeah, makes a really good point. Yeah. And even tofu, I want to say that 10 years ago where I grew up, tofu was not very easily accessible. It was accessible in the bigger cities where restaurants served it, especially the Asian restaurants, but it was not something that commonly was a part of my diet growing up. You know, it was only after I moved to United States and now it's so readily available at any grocery store. I learned how to make tofu and how to incorporate it in some of the Indian dishes, which is why, you know, I share it online so much. And 
I have not discussed this before, uh, but also my quest is to now turn towards veganism only for religious reasons. Now that I have so much awareness about how animals could be treated in the dairy industry. Mm -hmm. And that's the transition that I'm working on. And so I found that tofu is one of the most versatile foods that one can incorporate, you know, and I like how bland it is and you could marinate it with any seasonings and spices and herbs that you want and you know it goes well and i learned how you can include different types of tofu in your diet like the silken tofu goes so well in your smoothies and then the firm tofus can be used as a substitute for paneer which is um, a type of a cottage cheese used in the indian you know diet but then because it's made from dairy, you know, it's also high in saturated fat. And for people who are trying to work on limiting the saturated fat content of their diet, this could be a great substitute. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So how did, as you moved to the States, how did your passion as a registered dietitian, how did that start to morph into serving the community that you serve now? I remember working at an eating disorders clinic right after graduating with master's in nutrition science from San Jose State. And then I remember teaching this food and culture class at San Jose State. And I thought that when I taught the food and culture class, you know, a lot of my undergrad students were so curious about uh, the South Asian diet. And although the food and culture class involved learning about foods from uh, different cultures and countries because I was from India. They were so interested in learning about um, Indian diet, South Asian diet. And then I started to find that more and more people that I met, even in my practice as a clinical dietitian, were South Asians uh, wanting to, you know, get connected with a South Asian diet dietitian who knew their foods. And uh, that's how I started finding more and more interest in the South Asian client I, that I serve. Um, I do also work with a lot of Hispanic uh, population and African-American population in my current job um, at Alameda Health System, which serves the East Bay. What I found interesting was also how the two different jobs that I had, one was with technologically savvy patients of the Silicon Valley, who used apps and who had access to all kinds of foods and, you know, for whom nutrition was a privilege. And then in my current job where people from the underserved communities, vulnerable communities are trying to make a change. And it is so hard because of the social determinants of health. And then yeah. I might sit there and write the most fanciest of diets for them. But, you know, they're, if they're not going to be able to access those kind of foods, then they're not going to implement those recommendations. So I felt that, you know, after graduating and finding my passion, working with different cultural groups, I also like how I was able to serve different communities at the same time, you know. And I think that's the great part about nutrition and that it's not the same and it needs to change depending on what population you're serving. Yes. Yeah. Like we have to adapt with our patient or client that we're working with. It's not a one size fits all at all. Correct. Yeah. My maternal grandmother has diabetes. And so that's where I got passionate about this field. And um, we see that the diabetes rate is, you know, ever increasing. And when I learned that, um, you know, people who have prediabetes can totally prevent I don't want to say totally some, most of them are able to prevent the progression to type two diabetes for some, they are not able to, um, but most of them can prevent the progression to type two diabetes by adopting helpful eating patterns. Um, that's where I started to then combine my two passions for food culture and then disease prevention. And I chose diabetes as uh, one of the things because of the family history that I have. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's so neat. And I think it's cool how, our history shapes our passions and also to how, again, it's, yes. it's ever evolving just because like what you're passionate about when you first got out of school, doesn't mean you have to be passionate about that 10 years later, which is so Correct. great when you're working with some of your patients or clients, what are maybe some struggles that you see if they're, if they're wanting to eat more plants or go plant-based, what are some struggles or pain points that you see there? I think that for most people, they come to me not knowing why they want to go plant-based, you know, mm, sometimes yeah. for some people they are because they see this is trending on social media for other people. It's because the celebrity has been doing this for some people. It's because my friend went vegan and she saw all these health benefits, not saying that that's wrong. That's great. 
But what I am coming to is if you know your why for plant-based eating, then you're more likely to succeed because all the clients that come to me, I just want to make sure that they really want this before I go ahead and, you know, make recommendations and that this is not temporary and, you know, that is something that they're willing to practice for lifelong. Yes. Oh, that why so, is so important, like you said. That why is so important. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, just helping them start small. A lot of times they'll come to me and they'll be like, okay, I want to stop eating meat and, you know, I want to go all plant-based. And then I tell them, yeah, that your end goal is great, but, you know, think small, especially if I find that when I take a diet recall and the person has not been eating fruits and vegetables, you know, I try to tell them to think small and come up with small goals. Maybe adding a smoothie is a great way for you to take a step in the plant-based direction, not saying that you cannot go completely plant-based, but think small. Yes. Yes. Versus like overwhelming them with all the options that they could possibly take. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And, um, you know, a lot of times I find that when they start to go plant-based, they find that they have um, some like excessive bloating or gas, which of course comes from eating more plants, more beans and lentils. And I tell them that, you know, this is your body adjusting to it. And this could be temporary before you find a new balance. And um, you have to educate them on how eating more plants, beans and lentils is also creating a change in your gut microbiome. And so these are not necessarily bad signs. You know, in fact, this could be the sign that you're making progress and yeah. there are more good gut bacteria now. So it's going to overall help you a few weeks down the line. Some people share with me that they want to eat more plant-based, but then their family is not willing to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that can be hard. And I can totally understand that, that, you know, if your family is not eating plant-based, then it can be hard. But again, coming up with some small swaps for them, has been one of the tools that I use, uh, just showing them that, you know, let's say you are eating a hamburger, you know, you can very much go for a plant-based patty and still enjoy everything else that your family is eating. Yep. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like this big production or anything. It can be something small, or even just like you said, just one, like one piece of, but like a hamburger patty, switching that out for something else so that your plate yeah. doesn't really look that much different than your family members. Yeah. And also starting with maybe once a week or twice a week, you know, I think yeah. that that's something that people need to understand that when you want to go plant-based, it might not happen overnight. And it's okay if it's not all days of the week. Um, it's okay if you are for the most part plant-based, but enjoy eating fish, it still has benefits. Yes. So that's something that I want more and more people to understand that this can be a flexible style of eating. You know, it doesn't mean that you have to let go of favorite foods, but it can definitely mean for you to limit some of the things that you're doing in the animal based diet and focus more on plant based to create balance for yourself and also you know, for all the great things that plant-based eating has to offer, the health benefits, uh, less impact on the climate, all of those great things. Yep. Yeah. And small, like you're saying, small changes do add up. And that's something we talk about a lot on here. So for you listening, if you're thinking about transitioning, if you're transitioning right now, we do put so much pressure on ourselves that, oh, we have to get it done quickly, or it needs to be done by X amount of time, or I got to do it all overnight. It really can, you can do it at your own pace just like Sneha is saying, like, it doesn't have to be all at once. Um, it can be this gradual progression one day at a time, one week at a time. And then from there, you know, a few months in you'll be plant-based and you won't even know it. So yes, um, yeah, there's a lot of great things to that. So when you're working with clients and they're in that transitioning phase, um, or maybe they've been plant-based for a little while, or they're just eating more plants. Have you had any success stories or anything that like your clients are coming to you and you're like, oh, I, I can't believe this happened. Yes. Oh my God. I mean, I <laughs> see that all the time, especially when it comes to cholesterol reduction for mm -hmm. some of my patients that have been meat heavy and they start eating more plants within three months. I have seen their, seen their cholesterol levels change, their triglyceride levels change. They report having more energy. They report just feeling good from within. And again, this brings me back to what my grandmother used to share with me. 
I remember her telling us stories about, you know, slaughterhouse and how the animals feel and what kind of hormonal changes that happen in their body when they're going through this process of slaughtering. And imagine you eating something like that. How is it going to do any good to you? So when people do talk about all the, you know, changes that they have experienced, especially, you know, great uh, energy levels and clarity of thought, it brings me back to that example that my grandmother used to share with us. And I think that that's so impactful and we don't give that as much thought, but it can be life changing in that way. If you think about what goes on behind the scenes and then you're consuming that, it just, yeah, it doesn't add up. Plant-based, plant-based news put out, if we can find it, we'll put it below. They put out a little, it was like an animated video, which was kind of nice. It was animated probably. I mean, it has to be of like a cow kind of going through the slaughterhouse. Um, and from like the cow's perspective. And I just thought it was so beautifully illustrated and like what that experience is like. And then here we are, you know, consuming that, consuming that fear, consuming that sadness and potential yes. sickness and all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, cause in the Bay area, what does that look like? If someone's kind of in that area, how do people work with you? Most mm-hmm. people can connect with me on my Instagram handle, which is the vegetarian dietitian in the description or in my bio, I have a link where you can go and apply to work with me. And then I do discovery calls to find if we are a good fit for each other and we take it from there. Wonderful. And we'll include those links in the show notes. That way you can easily access um, Sneha's Instagram and all of that. Yeah. So they can connect with you. you. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your journey and your story. I just think it's such a unique perspective and I appreciate you just being so open and transparent about everything. Thank you. Thank you for this great opportunity. I love being on your show and uh, I hope that our paths cross in future and we both try and spread this message of compassionate eating, plant-based eating, because that's what the future is going to be. I remember reading, you know, a few articles on how plant-based eating is the next step to take in every way when it comes to saving earth and planet. Yeah. Yep. 100%. And for you listening, we're so thankful that you were with us today and I couldn't agree more that the future is plant-based eating. I mean, it really, really is so beautifully stated. Well, thank you again for being on. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You have a great day. Thank you. Until next time, keep thriving. 